Good evening, everyone. I'm Juliet Bianco, Interim Director at the Hood Museum of Art, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the fourth annual Manton Foundation Orozco Lecture. This series of lectures revolves around topics and themes related to Jose Clemente Orozco's mural, The Epic of American Civilization, completed between 1932 and 1934 on the ground level of the Dartmouth College Library. Once known as the Reserve Reading Room, the space is now, also thanks to the Manton Foundation, the Orozco Room. The naming celebrates the fact that, for just over 80 years, Dartmouth students have studied and contemplated their place in the world while surrounded by Orozco's radical and inspiring vision of our collective histories. Scholars, artists, and art lovers alike continue to come from around the world to engage with this exciting work, which in 2012 was conferred national landmark status by the National Park Service. All of this is to say that we here at the Hood Museum of Art express our deep gratitude to the Manton Foundation for its long-standing recognition of the importance of Orozco's Epic of American Civilization and its commitment to this remarkable mural's preservation here at Dartmouth College. I am delighted that the inaugural Manton lecturer, Mary Coffey, Associate Professor of Art History and Chair of the Art History Department, will introduce this evening's speaker, Luis Castaneda. Please join us upstairs for a reception in the Kim Gallery following the lecture, and it is now my pleasure to welcome Mary Coffey. Thank you. Well, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight and also to thank the Manton Foundation for, um, for creating this lecture series, which has been incredible for me as a scholar of Orozco and a lover of those murals and a, and a professor who teaches them in everything I do, because every year we get to collaborate to bring someone to campus uh, who can talk about art and um, visual culture from Mexico in some dialogue with the murals, but not necessarily about the murals. And it's also given us an opportunity to kind of expand the kind of speakers that we've brought from sort of me, the mural scholar, into uh, scholars who can illuminate. Last year, Barbara Mundi talked to us about the um, uh, representation of the pre-Columbian world in the murals. Um, and this year, Luis is going to open up a whole new horizon for us, I believe, in his talk. So I'm thrilled to introduce Luis Castaneda, who uh, is a, an assistant professor of Latin American art, architecture, and, and design uh, in the Department of Art and Music Histories at Syracuse University. He received his MA and PhD at NYU's Institute of Fine Arts, uh, and he has just recently, as of 2014, published this incredible book called Spectacular Mexico Design, Propaganda, and the 1968 Olympics. And I'm showing it to you because it's a, it's a marvel of design in and of itself and quite a step forward for University of Minnesota Press, which is a wonderful press for Latin American cultural studies, but not one that has historically been known for really beautiful books. And this is a beautiful book um, filled with incredible illustrations. Uh, I wanted to say something uh, briefly about how I came to know of Luis's work. Um, I was trying to get the rights to reproduce Lance Wyman's famous design for the Mexico City's Olympics in 1968, and I needed a contact for the artist. And my colleague and Luis's colleague, um, Eric Zolov, another really great scholar, uh, put me in touch with Luis. He said, oh, he's doing this incredible work on the Olympics. He'll know. <laughs> and so I contacted him by email, and he was incredibly generous and said, of course. And he gave me you know, how to reach him, and Lance was wonderful. He gave me the rights. Uh, and that sort of, we struck up a kind of a social media relationship at that point, <laughs> Facebook friends. But I hadn't really got to meet him, uh, and his book wasn't out yet. But I began to become acquainted with his writing at that point, which um, I have enjoyed thoroughly. In many ways, I feel like this is the book I wanted to write <laughs> when all those years ago when I was working on my first book, um, uh, because it really touches on uh, issues that were incredibly interesting and important to me, and that namely um, uh, the way in which the Mexican state sort of orchestrated an image of Mexico via um, design via, via exhibitionary practices. This is something I touch on in my work on muralism, but really his book takes off where my book leaves off and goes far more in depth and far uh, uh, more interesting ways than I was able to do. Uh, and I think it's a testimony to how um, expansive art history has become, that um, a book like this uh, um, is well um, uh, situated within the field. 
I want to say a little bit about the subject of this book before moving on to the last few bits of, of information about Luis. Um, one of the things he does in this book is um, uh, study the architectural um, uh, designs as well as the graphic design associated with the Mexico Olympics in 1968. Some of you may remember those Olympics, many of you probably do not. Um, they're very notable in history for many reasons. I'll, I'll just focus on the good reasons. Um, uh, the good reasons are it was really the most expansive and first serious cultural Olympia, that is the designing of a sort of expansive cultural project that would accompany the Olympics and be used to sort of foster and foment a whole series of agendas that the, the state had in hosting the Olympics. And even though the Olympics themselves are sort of historically remembered with a lot of controversy uh, surrounding the state massacre of student protesters on the eve of the Olympics or the famous black power fist um, by the um, uh, track athletes, um, uh, nonetheless, the legacy of the design around this Olympics is, is quite palpable and present in Mexico City. And anyone who's been to Mexico City and has used their subway system, which was begun as a part of the Olympic transportation system, um, is familiar with this legacy because the Olympic, or the metro system there, which is something that Luis talks about in a, a very nice chapter at the end of this book, uses a pictographic system. Um, of, of symbols uh, and uh, bright kind of day glow colors to uh, distinguish its various lines. So it's incredibly easy to navigate, very easy to sort of figure out where you are and where you're going within its system. Uh, and that design system um, comes from the graphic um, uh, sort of repertoire of the Olympics. And so I said I told Luis I'm going to be a little geeky. I brought some of my memorabilia. I have tons of this stuff. I was really obsessed with the Olympics about 10 years ago and bought things in flea markets back when they were really cheap. They're not anymore, as Luis reminded me, or they're scarce. Um, but these are just one of uh, three of many of the uh, kinds of cultural um, uh, projects that were disseminated by the Olympic Committee, um, the Mexico um, Olympic Committee, to uh, the international community. These are in English. Um, in this instance, and you can see these uh, pictographic um, uh, motifs that were all designed uh, by the graphic design team, and of course the famous logo that combines um, an op-ed aesthetic with a kind of huichol palette um, and uh, with making references to that indigenous group. Another here that shows all the models for the um, new buildings that were going to be um, built as part of the Olympic Library. And this is my favorite. This is advertising a children's art exhibition that was held in conjunction with the Olympics where they've reproduced little um, images that children have made of the different events in the Olympics in the day clo palette that they had elaborated for the, um, the games. So I'm going into all this detail because it helps to give you a sense of the expansive definition of architecture and design that Luis employs, um, uh, drawing from other scholars, but if significantly moving that work forward. He thinks about it in an expanded field, and particularly the way in which architectural and design uh, architecture and design gets disseminated in sort of mass cultural imagery um, uh, around the world, in nationally and internationally. And these are, of course, a kind of perfect example of this expanded field, because these obviously aren't buildings, nor are they designed objects. Well, they are designed objects, but, um, uh, but they reproduce in image form all of these um, uh, endeavors. So uh, that was book number one. <laughs> Luis has also published um, many um, uh, journal articles in uh, journals such as Grey Room, the Journal of Surrealism Studies, and the Journal of Design History on things Olympics, Mexico 68 design, and the way that Mexico generally has leveraged its pre-Columbian heritage on the national and international stage. He has a wonderful essay about the, the use of Olmec heads, these massive sculptural heads in um, promoting Mexican um, uh, um, culture in New York as well as in Mexico City. Uh, he's also on the verge of publishing a co-edited anthology with the Museum of Modern Art in conjunction with the design um, show there. Uh, this is a co-edited anthology with Patricio del Real and Azuiler Lima called Taking Positions, Architects Write in Latin America, 1920 to 1985. It's a primary documents volume, one of a series that MoMA's been publishing. It's been very important for scholars working in modernism in parts of the world that haven't been canonized thoroughly. Uh, and finally, he's got a new book project called Bureaucratic Modernism, Architecture and State Power in Latin America, in which he branches out beyond Mexico. There is a chapter on Mexico, but as he was just telling me, one on Peru and one on um, Rio de Janeiro, um, and looking at sort of big design projects um, undertaken in these three locations. And a talk, his talk today will be um, uh, uh, one of the chapters in that project. So 
without further ado, I'll let Luis tell you what he's going to talk about. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much, uh, Mary, for that uh, way too kind introduction. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for the invitation and the Manton Foundation for the generous support of this lecture and, of course, for their much broader commitment to the appreciation of the multiple legacies of muralism, um, a, a, a small fragment of which I'm going to be speaking about um, today. So uh, if you take a close look at this photograph, this is a school being built in the city of uh, Vadodara in India, 1964. If you look closely, you may notice the curious presence of these large uh, images of uh, Father Miguel Hidalgo, uh, and right there where I pointed, and right next to him, Jose Maria Morelos, uh, all these uh, kind of mythical figures of Mexican cultural history um, uh, featured very prominently in the uh, structure of the school as these images that animate its space you may be wondering, like I did when I first saw this picture, what's going on? Like, what's the story? This seems strangely out of place. The images that I am describing, which are kind of a pantheon of uh, the founding fathers of Mexico, essentially, grace an otherwise fairly rudimentary looking building, which is itself defined by a frame of steel, uh, an infill of glass and brick. And though all of this may seem to be very removed from where we are right now, listening to this lecture in space as well as in time, what I'm going to argue is that the cultural project that this image represents, namely, this image is a very small fragment of a much larger experiment with education that originated in Mexico in the 20th century, is in fact very powerfully connected to the space where this lecture is happening right now, to the history of this campus, uh, and to the ethos behind uh, all of these uh, multiple layers of muralism and its associated histories. This particular school from 1964 is one of thousands of rural schools uh, based on a singular architectural type, but subject to local variations that were built in Mexico and eventually in many parts of the world during the mid 20th century for a few decades. The interiors uh, of the schools, uh, on one of which located in Mexico you're now seeing on the left, included the complete or a complete visual pantheon of Mexican independence and post-revolutionary heroes. Uh, and these cinematically arranged images that you see on the top left would define the classroom experience regardless of where the particular school, the exemplar of the type, was located. Uh, often, the exteriors of these schools would also be defined by the presence of murals, many of them produced by the users of the school, as in this case, which is an exemplar of a school built in Mexico. And together, all of these exemplars of uh, these, all these portable vessels for the export and for the literal mobilization of Mexican avant-garde culture are part of this fascinating and understudied trajectory I want to retrace uh, with you today. And I want to demonstrate that this trajectory connects together the works of a unique generation of mid-20th century artists and architects with those of the earlier Mexican avant-garde's. A trajectory that involves these seemingly remote sites as directly and powerful as it does, as I said, this campus, where another small fragment of the expansive muralist experience also resides. Today, I'm not only gonna chart this trajectory, I'm gonna argue though that an analysis of these artifacts uh, is essential to understanding the full geographical and cultural dimension of the muralist experience, an experience that of course, scholars like Mary Coffey, uh, James Olds, Anna Indich Lopez, among many others, have so skillfully taught us about in recent years. So I'm building on a number of insights, but I wanna uh, take us further in an alternative direction. These prefabricated schools were more specifically a hybrid type, which encompassed both a rural school and a dwelling for a school teacher. Uh, and they're all part, uh, these two elements are combined in the same program. Uh, Pedro Ramirez Vazquez, which is perhaps the most politically connected architect of 20th century Mexico, the architect who was the chief organizer of those very important Olympics, designed this prototype between 1957 and 1960, and he did so while he was the chief officer of the Federal Administrative Committee for School Construction, known by its acronym of CAPSE in Spanish, which was a state agency founded in the early 40s in Mexico 
to oversee the production of public schools. Over the course of this architect's tenure at uh, CAPSE, which took place as uh, or in conjunction with the single party rule of the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or the PRI, PRI, and which really took place as a direct result of the ties of the architect to the PRI's power circles, which were very profound, the production of these schools, some of which you see in this photograph that I am now showing, expanded considerably, not only in Mexico, very quick, but the project eventually became this major transnational endeavor of cultural export. The idea behind the project for this prefabricated school type is essentially to provide an infinitely replicable building type that could nonetheless take on any number of site-specific manifestations. Here, for instance, is one example built in the state of Baja California, which I have drawn from promotional materials for the schools. And this particular school, which you see on the right, uh, is defined by the use of brick as its infill, whereas, for example, here is another example of the same type from the state of Colima, where concrete, brick, and steel are the materials of choice. Thus, factors like the climate, uh, economic availability of specific materials or even cultural preferences uh, and so on determined the final form of each of the exemplars of the type. And what this image is also showing you are two things that are significant. This is, you know, the location of this particular school's construction, the number of units then completed, this image is from 1960, and then the uh, chief of the area, each uh, a kind of an engineer or an architect was assigned a state, and then as a state representative oversaw the construction of these exemplars. Though it seems to be very laconic, uh, this steel frame, which is the one constant in the middle of all the changes, has a lot to say about the deeper rationale of this project as a whole. In the most basic sense, this building type was envisioned really as an architectural avatar of the state that sponsored it. And this avatar was sent out into the deepest hinterlands of the national territory, spaces usually described by these architects and uh, politicians explicitly as a kind of internal frontier in need of uh, colonization, in need of civilization sometimes, they would say, or of control. And it not only served this practical function of being a school, but it also operated as a representative, sometimes the only representative, of the presence of the state in these territories. And here, there's a long history of, of uh, efforts to do something similar through education in Mexico, which actually take us back to the pre-Republican period of Mexico, but this is the mid-20th century situation. And indeed, the combination of a kind of universal frame, unchanging frame, and local infills that changed didn't only define the appearance of the schools, the ones that I've been showing you, but also their actual production. So this promotional image of the prototype, and this exemplar is in Tabasco, uh, explains that here what it calls neighborhood cooperation, and here an image representing that, which is really local labor put to work in order to produce the exemplar of the type, um, was built into the logic of productions of the schools. And so the construction of each of these schools brought about you could almost say it necessitated a clientelist circuit of collaboration between state authorities, architects, and the often underserved communities for which the school was produced. This is a key aspect of the function of the building too. It doesn't just, it's not just an image of the state. Uh, it establishes this uneven, fundamentally uneven relationship between all these parties that I'm mentioning, but it establishes the necessity for an ongoing uh, kind of collaboration and say clientelist in the sense that it is really an exchange of favors. The labor, the local labor, this uh, comes in, the school is produced, and then a bond is created. Um, and once the school is completed, uh, it, it served, one of the, it, these schools would have served not only as, as schools in the conventional sense we might think of them, but as a kind of primary gathering point for not just education in the traditional sense, our traditional sense of education, but for all these other patriotic rituals, uh, such as the one that the photograph on the top documents. So it's obvious that in these remote locations, what these schools did, all these things that these schools did, and that the, there was an attempt to um, 
not have the schools be only uh, uh, kind of an image of a regime, of a government, or of an idea of governmentality, but that their performance of the schools from their production to their inhabitation reinforced this uh, dialogue. And at the center of everything was the presence of murals. So the histories, of course, of prefabrication and of modern architecture in the biggest, in the biggest sense are, of course, intimately related, perhaps especially so during the second half of the 20th century. So Ramirez Vasquez's project on the left is fundamentally connected to many examples, and here I'm only bringing one up for reference. Uh, but for example, on the right, we're seeing the experimental uses of prefabricated materials uh, by the French architect Jean Prouvé who produced a series of responses to a need for lightweight mass-produced buildings in a series of geographical contexts, both throughout Europe and uh, beyond. And indeed, the prototype of the rural school has all these uh, uh, kind of verified connections to a number of modernist precedents. It was shown, for example, uh, at the, on the left, at the Milan Triennial of 1960, where it was awarded an important prize and there, at that show, it was exhibited alongside multiple other attempts to create prefabricated schools, such as the ones you're seeing on the right, which are an example produced in the United Kingdom. So suffice it to say that there's a very big conversation around this type of school building that dominates uh, a big part of architecture in the middle of the 20th century. At the same time, as these connections are very powerful, there is a very localized history of experimental approaches to the form and function of public education in Mexico to which these prefabricated schools also belong. And this history directly involves the legacies of muralism. And it is to this relationship that uh, I want to turn, if you allow me, in what remains of the lecture. So decades before Ramirez Vasquez in the early 30s, uh, Mexican architect Juan O'Gorman, who was then sponsored paired with the very radical Secretary of Public Education, Narciso Azols, on the right. Uh, I sh when I look at that picture on the right, you realize how little men's fashion has changed over time. Uh, and also, every one of these cultural bureaucrats of the 30s looks exactly the same. They all have the same glasses, at least. Anyway, just an observation. But this pair, this alliance between a cultural avant-gardist inside of a state and an architect produced a series of very famous functionalist schools. And in this case, it was reinforced concrete, of course, shaped to recall the formal languages of the architecture of industry, which really was marshaled to produce a direct indictment of the immediately previous architectures of public education that had preceded this experiment. The buildings that are uh, like the one on the right, which is are produced right after Mexico's revolution, of course, uh, and which represented what O'Gorman and Basols uh, directly opposed, even what they uh, 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 reviled. And then uh, the state-sponsored architecture on the right is full of iconographic allusions to what O'Gorman and Basols saw as a very reductive idea of Mexican culture. So the school on the right by Obregón Santa Cilia, another architect very much tied to the state in the early moment of the 20th century, uh, was trying to give form to the then prevalent notion, uh, but never uh, exclusively prevalent notion, that Mexico was a result of cultural hybridization between imperial Spanish and Amerindian culture, a slippery concept, one of whose names it has several names. One of this, its names is mestizaje. Uh, and it attempted to create this sense by reviving the forms of Mexico's culturally hybrid colonial architecture. So O'Gorman uh, was attempting, of course, to wipe the slate clean of these references, and he famously included murals in a series of his schools, notably one on the top in a different school by Pablo Higgins, one of the founding members of the TGP, the Workshop of Popular Graphics, uh, extremely important avant-garde. Um, uh, kind of collective. So like the school's architectural language on the top, which is purposely devoid of any culturally specific references to history or tradition or any such notion, the mural is also meant to function as a device of demystification. It's, it, it, everybody here is explicit about the function of the mural. Uh, one that wipes the cultural slate clean in order to make way for the kind of liberation of the students. And that's 
the students are, like in the mural, encouraged to move forth, their minds liberated from the shackles of tradition uh, towards a future of radical enlightenment. And these schools really are, were understood precisely uh, in that light. These are urban schools, not rural schools, but they do provide, an ex uh, these experimental functionalist schools of the 30s do provide one obvious precedent for Ramirez Vasquez's prototypes. But in the intervening years between these two episodes, on the bottom we're looking at the 1930s, one moment of fervent production, and at the top we're looking at the late 50s, early 60s, another very key moment. In the intervening period is too complex to really draw any kind of simple, clear connection, as if uh, our, uh, the, the kind of the, the future of these types of programs had followed any clear stylistic line of development or anything like that. Indeed, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of interest in the intervening moment, which is uh, uh, what I'm going to turn to now. Uh, and by the time, for example, that this institution I mentioned at the beginning, CAPSE, this state institution specifically devoted to the construction of schools, by the time this was founded, around 1944, there were all these different uh, and sometimes very deep ideological divisions between the architects involved with the endeavor. There were all these, we're seeing now the exhibition of CAPSE curated in 1945 by Hannes Meyer, of course the very important, very influential Swiss-born architect who was at that time based in Mexico. And the large map we were looking at uh, provides a diagram of the network of schools that the agency had built in the first year of its life. And you're seeing, you know, locations, numbers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And as mentioned previously, CAPSE was really this large group, encompassed a large group of architects and uh, who had all kinds of series of, of views about the problem of public education infrastructure. And then one really dominant faction, perhaps the dominant faction in the early years, is led by or is the environment of architect Mario Pani, whom we are seeing here at the show, displaying a model of his national teacher school in Mexico City to then President Manuel Avila Camacho, to the left, here, under the creepy eye of the Secretary of Public Education, uh, 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 Jaime uh, Torres Bodet, uh, who is Secretary of Education, Public Education at this point, and who will return, and who is a really key figure uh, in this whole conversation. The building we're looking at, this is the model, of course, but the actual building proved uh, very controversial at the time for a number of reasons. It was built on expropriated lands by CAPSE, this agency in Mexico City, it was meant to be the signature building of the entire institution, and its form was nonetheless indebted to Pani's Beaux-Arts training uh, in a series of ways. For example, its symmetrical facade on the right, punctuated by a large tower placed at the convergence point of two curving wings, uh, which organizes the space around the building. Uh, was uh, very much part of this tradition, while the use of other details, uh, these fluted concrete columns on which uh, these classicizing figurative sculptural panels rest on the bottom. Uh, all of them kind of reveal uh, Pani's uh, background. And by the way, this is a contemporary picture at the bottom of the image, the historical image on the top, where uh, you're not seeing this tower, which was demolished uh, years afterwards, but it nonetheless gives you a sense, uh, as does this detail of the kind of language that is used in this uh, uh, signature building. The building also, of course, included murals by uh, Jose Clemente Orozco. Uh, death, defeat and death of ignorance on the left in the interior, and the people approach or people approach the doors, the doorways of the school there on the right. And even more importantly, and even more prominent, of course, at this building uh, was a third mural uh, for the open air auditorium, which is towards the back of the project. Uh, by Orozco titled National Allegory, which deconstructs, I mean, does a number of things, and it's a very complex image, but it re de kind of deconstructs and recomposes the elements of the Mexican coat of arms, uh, flirting with abstraction very interestingly. And the coat of arms, of course, of Mexico is that paradigmatic image of an eagle slaying a snake, uh, which is meant to recall the myth of foundation of the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. 
The mural is produced with uh, all kinds of kind of interesting uh, uh, materials, industrial materials, and, and a monumental scale. It, it represents a departure for this particular muralist, and it is one of his more interesting compositions. And although these, this mural in particular is rightly celebrated as an important one, the school's perceived conservatism was amply criticized. For example, look at this. Uh, this is a caricature of the building produced by uh, another faction of architects where, which is making fun, of course, of Pani's refined, quote-unquote, French taste. Uh, it crassly feminizes the building. Uh, it suggests chairs, lamps, rugs, and what they call other decorative elements for the building. And it provides in the center this kind of mock plan of the building's architecture, which makes fun of all those curves, those Beaux-Arts curves that define the building. And it, in the end, it takes a kind of final uh, snipe at uh, um, Pani and his architecture in the, if you read the bottom, saying that um, although uh, it, it, all these suggestions that the caricature uh, presents are not cheap, they are curved, it says, um, which is obviously making fun of the uh, classicizing forms of the building. So, Another problem here, of course, was that the building, which was supposed to be the signature building of the state agency devoted to building public education infrastructure, was perceived to be uh, kind of uh, using murals as pure decoration, a major sticking point of uh, a lot of different projects around this time, and that its grandiosity was at odds with what ought to be the more kind of functional, practical dimensions of the state agency it was supposed to represent. So the young Ramirez Vasquez is already working at CAPSE. As all of this is happening, he's been deployed as a representative of this institution to the state of Tabasco, where two things happen that are formative. He encounters this tropical environment of Mexico for which his later prototype will first be envisioned. And he also goes to this, uh, is confronted with this situation as an architect working for the state, uh, where he finds that the presence of the state is absolutely minimal. So he starts thinking of all these prototypes for experimental schools in this kind of, with this dual realization of, of his position as a state architect. And this is really influential over how he's gonna proceed in the future. Around this time he thinks of, for example, this prototype made of wood elevated on high supports for areas that float regularly, and a series of other ideas where he's already combining the idea of a school with the school teacher's house, which is the origin of that prototype for prefabricated materials that he will later uh, develop. In addition to this episode, formative episode, the other formative episode for, to which this, for which this architect participates is that other major theater for the public debates about public education, muralism, and the fate of modern architecture in Mexico, which is the, the creation of the university city in Mexico City. Ramirez Vasquez is part of the team at this time, does many things, but the kind of, uh, out in the open what he does is that he produces the city's school of medicine with a team that, as we see, prominently features a mural about Mexico's cultural synthesis of Western and pre-Hispanic cultural elements, uh, made of colored mosaic by Francisco uh, Epens. And the campus, this whole campus is traditionally thought of and celebrated as a point of stylistic uh, consolidation in the history of Mexican modernism, when in fact the commission was defined by these very interesting conflicting agendas, some of them kind of petty conflicts between architects, some of them uh, deeper uh, conflicts about murals and architecture and public education's futures. One fundamental debate, perhaps the biggest debate that really defines the campus, has to do with two opposing views about what the campus ought to be as an object. One represented on the left by the plan by Pani and Enrique del Moral, uh, and the other represented by the position of the general manager of the project, not the author of the project, architect Carlos Lasso, who produces that image I'm showing you on the right. And Lasso is his kind of a shady guy, really interesting shady architect, shady in the best sense, uh, and also in the kind of dark sense, but anyway, really interesting and understudied but fundamental figure who's working behind the scenes in all kinds of ways. The master plan on the left for the campus preserves traces, at least, of Pani's Beaux-Arts repertoire on several levels, most obviously in the very precise axiality that determines the orientations of the buildings, vis-a-vis -vis the expansive quad at its core. And it negotiates a tradition of doing university campuses with a modernist idea of the functional zoning of a mini city when you do a campus. 
Lasso conceptualizes the project very, very differently, uh, expressing not his conception not through a plan, but through that diagram on the right entitled Planning on the World Scale, where the notion of the space of the university is not a fluid, uh, a static environment, but a fluid environment uh, for exchanges of technology, uh, uh, ideology, uh, economic exchanges, and it's placed very purposely, the campus appears in that diagram in this detail as the center, the vessel for all these exchanges in a geopolitical diagram of influence. And in the detail, the red lines look at the campus as a site of convergence, uh, not really as an architectural artifact in the obvious sense, but as uh, perhaps what Lasso said about the campus at the cornerstone uh, ceremony for the project, where he claimed that the campus was, quote, at a frontier point of two races and two cultures in the capital of the country, where everybody converges, on the Pan American Highway, the axis of America, which extends its arms to join together the Indo-Latin to the Anglo-American cultures, and realizes in our territory, meaning in Mexico, the basic continental synthesis, that of the humanism of classical culture and of the scientific and dynamic knowledge of our time. So these are kind of uh, code for fighting words that take us back to an internal debate uh, at the uh, core of the production of the campus. And they really come about in relation to some key decisions that Lasso pushed for at that campus. For instance, Lasso was largely responsible for the prominence of murals at the campus, which is a very little known fact until recently. Um, and he was participant in the debate about Integración Plástica, which is very roughly translated here as a structural integration of painting, sculpture, and architecture that defined the whole conversation about that campus. Uh, Lasso thought of murals as key devices for the fulfillment of the campus's mission, but only if these devices were truly experimental and only if they truly were integrated within buildings. So Lasso eventually, although he pushed for murals, he eventually echoed the critique that you're seeing reflected in these images by Del Moral, the architect, who was one of the two planners of the campus, who denounced that the murals on the right-hand side in the library of the campus and on the left-hand side in the Olympic Stadium of the campus were mere decoration over finished buildings, not actual structural integrations where mural and architecture were indistinguishable. This is part of a long conversation in Mexican muralism but Lasso's participation is important because although he pushed for the murals, he eventually was very critical of the results at the campus, even critical of this particular intervention, which was the one he pushed for the hardest, uh, Siqueiros' contribution to the rector's tower, which gets a little bit closer perhaps to the notion of a mural being more than just decoration on a building, but which nonetheless was perceived even by Siqueiros himself to fall short of these expectations for integration. This is the surface of the critique, really, that Lasso elaborates. There's this whole other hidden critique where Lasso very interestingly plays the role of double agent. Uh, this is a letter sent by, I'll go, you of course don't have to read it, but look at who signs the letter. Among the people who signed the letter are Ramirez Vasquez and others. Uh, some of these architects are involved with the campus and it's a letter asking for the worked on the, on the University City campus to stop completely and to be replaced with a different project. It's a letter sent at the time when uh, construction is already going at full steam. It's very, actually very late to turn back. And it's a letter that is sent to Lasso. And then the letter asks Lasso to relay the message of the letter to the funding manager for the project. So it's this bureaucratic dialogue. And the funny thing is that although this letter is sent to Lasso, Lasso probably was one of its secret authors because Lasso was on the one hand the public manager of the project, but he was also the manager, the manager of internal dissent, who was actually pushing for the destruction of the project of which he was publicly the administrative face. And the critique of the letter has to do with this, uh, the question of the campus as a static versus a mobile architecture. An interesting conceptual problem specifically has to do with the problem that these architects say they perceive with the campus being conceived in a traditional manner as a fixed, precious architectural object, not as a dynamic space of exchange like the space that Lasso described, and not as a space that is even infrastructurally connected well to the city. 
And that's the justification that the letter offers. Of course, there is an actual justification here that points to a deep divide. There's also internecine divisions between the architectural establishment that explain this. But nonetheless, Lasso is playing both sides at the same time. So this whole, uh, and of course, interestingly, after Lasso dies in 1955, Architects like Ramirez Vasquez come out to say that Lasso really should be considered the author of the campus, despite the, uh, the campus's shortcomings. This letter on the left is addressed to Ramirez Vasquez, is a critique of what some architects say is irresponsible on his part for saying that Lasso is the author. Here on the right, this reads, after Lasso died, or with Lasso dead, all these different fathers of the university city are all of a sudden appearing. This whole debate takes really years to be never really fully resolved, but it points to that uh, uh, kind of uh, discontent with the traditional um, application of murals in the learning space of the campus. So this UNAM situation, this whole situation, provides one of two backdrops for Ramirez Vasquez's ascent. Um, it is in the aftermath of that episode that he eventually succeeds Pani as the architect most connected to the presidential circle. And this is a really rich comparison. Here we're looking, there's a lot of details here, but here on the left is Pani showing the president the model of his educational building. There on the right is Ramirez Vasquez here showing another president his educational building. And the constant in the two pictures is the same secretary of public education. Here is Torres Bodet. Here is Torres Bodet again. And it says a lot about the function of public architecture, particularly educational infrastructural architecture, which is this interface where architects, bureaucrats, uh, technicians, politicians, all uh, kind of uh, intersect. Um, and it's also, of course, you could say that Ramirez Vasquez is pulling a pani in that picture on the right. He's doing exactly the same ceremonial gesture of showing his prototype for uh, a building for, for public education. And the buildings, of course, have changed from that monumental, precious, beautiful Beaux-Arts building that Pani produces to the prefabricated uh, mobile architecture that Ramirez Vasquez is going to push. The UNAM situation is one backdrop. The other uh, backdrop, uh, this, by the way, uh, I want to say Ramirez Vasquez's ascent is not smooth at all. This is one letter that accuses him of being basically a mafioso of architecture. Uh, saying that he's uh, you know, uh, doing all these corrupt things, not without foundation, because it's not entirely false that he was doing that. Um, and it's, it, it's a letter sent to Torres Boyd saying, please remove yourself from the, the situation with this architect. He's a terrible person. You are a good person. Please uh, uh, don't uh, endorse Ramirez Vasquez's ascent. Nonetheless, the ascent happens. And then the other backdrop, in addition to the University City, is Ramirez Vasquez's more direct use of prefabrication in a series of pavilions, where murals are also central. This is a pavilion for the World's Fair of Brussels, 1958, where you see really murals in at least two places. The exterior of the building is defined by this mural mosaic, uh, seen here in one angle and here in the other. So that's the exterior of the mural. And the interior of the mural has all these, the interior of the pavilion has all these murals, including this one, which is a revival of a Maya mural, a replica. Um, and this pavilion, in addition to having these environments with murals, also, of course, showcase the work of the muralists themselves. And it's a, a pavilion where Ramirez Vazquez collaborates with Fernando Gamboa. Even more interestingly, in another pavilion, you have the case in the pavilion for Seattle 1962, where not only is this a prefabricated building, but the mur a mural, a very experimental mural, actually encompasses what the entire pavilion is about. Uh, essentially, this pavilion is meant to showcase the industrial and artisanal production of objects of Mexico. And Manuel Felgueres, a very, of course, important architect, also uh, experimenting with the murals, creates a two-sided mural, which uh, the entire surface of which is defined by the presence of objects that are literally embedded on the mural on both sides. And on the right-hand side, you can see part of the reception of that De Los Ramirez Vasquez again, looking at this mural as an emblematic of Mexican development, of Mexican industry. Uh, and it's as if the mural in this particular case really takes over, uh, it has precedence over the building which encloses it. And even in Ramirez Vasquez's permanent, more conventional architecture, there is this attempt, it's very famously in the case of the museum, to transcend the static 
limitations of the murals that were criticized at UNAM and elsewhere. So it's as if in this most traditional of his commissions, he is attempting to create an experimental uh, uh, experience of a mural, specifically a mural that tr allows a building to transcend its fixity in time and space. Uh, uh, it's not a particularly interesting mural as far as the murals in this space are, concer uh, are, are concerned. Uh, this, of course, as Professor Coffey has talked about, there's all these very interesting murals in this, in this building, but there's one mural that is underrated but is nonetheless, I think, the site of one of the more uh, kind of transfer, uh, experimental attempts that the museum as a whole tries to make. This is the social space of the museum, defined by this pond of water and by this uh, kind of cantilevered umbrella uh, clad in aluminum with these permanent streams of water that uh, run through it. Um, and in another angle, uh, this on the left is looking towards, uh, in the opposite direction in the same patio, this pool, this pond of water opens, uh, is at the opening of the Aztec room, which is the biggest room in the museum, the most important room in the museum. Uh, the most uh, revered room in the museum, to the degree that that guide on the right, which is from an American tourist who went to Mexico, uh, this tourist was clearly got the logic of the building, and they were supposed to. Uh, well, many details here uh, to kind of analyze, uh, among them how dutiful this particular visitor is at noting where the bathrooms are and all that other stuff. But also, this visitor followed the logic of the building perfectly, going straight like that arrow to the big Aztec hall, the biggest, the centerpiece of the entire museum. Uh, there's all these other pre-Columbian cultures and uh, kind of living cultures of Mexico represented, but the center of the building is the Aztec room. In fact, the guide tells you that with these feet, Teotihuacan style feet, that actually lead you from the ground floor, the entrance is the entrance of the building, directly first to the Aztec hall, where the spectacle of the museum is most powerful. And there's all these things at that Aztec Hall, the major, major works of pre-Columbian sculpture, Aztec sculpture, and there's this mural. Not really a great mural compared to the other murals here, not even a great mural in general, I should say, I should confess, but a mural where, which was supposed to start, start, set off this amazing chain reaction that has remained incomplete in the building because of the events I'm gonna describe. This is the Aztec Room, the, the back of the Aztec Room past the most amazing stuff in the room, really, where you see this uh, mural that revives the aquatic scenography of ancient Tenochtitlan, juxtaposed with a model of the ceremonial center of ancient Tenochtitlan. So water, right? Tenochtitlan was, of course, a city in water. Water was so central to its scenography. This works in conjunction with that spectacle of water that is on the other end of the patio. That permanent rainfall that always is flowing uh, across the patio from that room, in addition to the pond, which is also supposed to kind of take you back in time and space and experience something about the aquatic scenography of Tenochtitlan. So water and rain and the mural in the middle of the spectacle. And then there was another piece of the puzzle, uh, specifically this, a monolith taken to the museum in the middle of this extremely controversial set of events in 1963-64, which was a monolith, an a uh, believed to be an Aztec monolith to rep that represented the uh, deity of rain, Tlaloc, the central deity of rain. This is the monument being trucked to the museum. This is the monument being paraded when it arrived to Mexico City before it got to the museum. And of course, remember, this is supposed to be this talismanic artifact that talks about the deity of rain, and the amazing thing is that when it was paraded here uh, in April 64, uh, this downpour took place, which was completely out of season, as the monolith of rain was being paraded. And that's actually a fact. That actually did happen. Um, so, of course, that adds to the mythological status of this whole episode. But there was a really precise location for this monolith. It's a giant monolith. Uh, they had to build a kind of custom-made uh, 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 vehicle just to carry it because it was so heavy. Um, and there was a precise location for it, which was this one. There was a dummy here, a dummy here, of this, the museum in construction, showing you the location where that monolith was supposed to uh, be, which is opening the Aztec room. So this is how the spectacle was supposed to work. You would experience the water spectacles in this courtyard. You would look at the pond, which reminded you of ideally of the Aztec aquatic city. You would look at the permanent rainfall that the umbrella was about. You would see the monolith of the 
uh, deity associated with rain. And then you would start making these associations that would transcend the space of the building, literally taking you on this time travel experience um, uh, uh, through, you know, and beyond the physical space of the building and beyond the time space uh, uh, location in which you were when you went to the museum. Uh, and of course this was not to be uh, in part because it took so long to get the monolith into the museum, but by the time the, that monolith came to the museum, the perimeter walls of the museum were already built and the monolith is so large it literally it just did not fit. So that monolith is outside the museum. Now some of you may have seen it on the uh, big avenue leading up to the museum where it doesn't quite have the same impact. And this was really the whole plan. But the key here is that it didn't stop inside the building. I mean, this whole lacustrine aquatic scenography extends far beyond the building in a kind of Russian doll-like relationship to also encompass the general environment where the museum is in an urban uh, scenario. That is to say, the, the park where the museum is, which is Chapultepec Park, this park which is the place, of course, Chapultepec is the place where the first migration mythically starts before the foundation of the city of Tenochtitlan, and it's also a place defined by its aquatic scenography. And it was remodeled in 1964. It was meant to open at the same time as the building on the left, and you as the visitor, when you saw this conjunction, the scenographic arrangement of objects, were supposed to make all these connections between the management of water uh, in the Aztec times, the spectacle of water inside the courtyard of the museum, and then expand further beyond this, the space of the museum to also encompass the very big, very prominent urban park and the water ways of the park uh, where the museum is situated. The idea here is that all this was really supposed to start with a mural. The mural as such really is not particularly important. It's the chain reaction of associations that the mural was supposed to start, having to do with water, with the Aztecs, and so on, uh, and in conjunction with all of these objects. That was really the whole point of this space. So in a way, um, uh, it's an incomplete spectacle even today uh, that uh, because the monolith could not be placed inside as the anchor of this whole spectacle. So the idea here is that Ramiz Vasquez, having witnessed this whole debate about murals, is trying in a way to uh, transcend the limitation of the mural format, right? The fixity of a mural in space. This is a debate for all the muralists. All the muralists are kind of struggling with this problem about transcending the physical and spatial limitations of a mural to create this uh, uh, kind of not only cinematic experience, but also uh, a, an expanded environmental experience of, the, uh, of something that is much more than illusionistic space of painting. And in this case, the, the challenge is tackled not by creating a particularly interesting mural, because as I said, the mural in and of itself is not particularly interesting, but through this scenographic manipulation of the place where the mural is, through this curatorial arrangement of objects, which makes the mural into so much more than itself. And of course, for this particular idea of water, of Tlaloc, and all that stuff, there is a mural, a lake muralist, or I should say, Integración Plástica precedent. Uh, which is the site of the uh, Lerma Waterworks, also nearby in Chapultepec Park by Diego Rivera and from the early 50s, where he produces this sculptural architectural intervention that does a number of things. It simultaneously honors Tlaloc's relationship to fertility, to rain, and so on, and commemorates the deaths, really in a kind of populist fashion, of laborers who built the waterway system that uh, produces the water in the park, and which at the time, uh, was also the water supply of the city. And in this case, there's a similar play between real water, virtual water, painted water, and the rest of the space, which you're seeing there on the right, where again, it's the idea of a mural transcending its uh, kind of fixity in space and time, creating this transtemporal kind of cinematic experience, and interacting very interestingly with an actual uh, presence of water in the middle of an, a functioning infrastructural device. And this is very obviously the precedent for the spectacle that the Museum of Anthropology wanted to create vis-a-vis -vis, uh, water. So Ramirez Vasquez, I really throw the whole time, and even before he had anything to do with the UNAM, was a close student of Rivera's uh, work and writing and theory. And he clearly did his homework, or tried to do his homework, when he was trying to essentially replicate the spectacle that you're seeing here in his museum. But there is an even deeper relationship, deeper relationship 
uh, that runs deeper than that obvious encounter, that obvious kind of citation that I was just talking about, which is going to help me sketch out a conclusion. Ram Ramiz Vasquez's work obviously remains entangled, like the works of basically all the architects I've mentioned, artists I've mentioned thus far, with the central question of uh, fixity in space, mobility versus a static position of an object, it runs really deep through the muralist imagination. As we know, Rivera was particularly interested in experimenting with the portable mural as a format, most famously in the context of a commission produced for the Museum of Modern Art in 1931, and the work uh, titled Agrarian Leader Zapata, which we're looking at here, really actually experimented beyond the visible frame with a frame of galvanized steel as its material support, which we're seeing on the right, thanks to a kind of radiographic image. And the support, that support, which had to be resilient enough for a, a mural to travel, was the result of Rivera's, one of many uh, kind of uh, moments in Rivera's lifelong experimentation with architects, which is really important. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, as we know, though, inevitably this is, uh, has all these limitations, this particular project. It's read as a fragment of a larger narrative. Uh, it eventually proved narratively limited by the materiality of its frame. And it also proved, because it was essentially heavy, uh, to, uh, and because it was commodified uh, as a kind of precious one-of-a-kind artifact, to actually not be very movable at all. And it's this very interesting uh, uh, question to which, of course, Orozco later will provide an arguably much more successful um, response. But that's another story. But the prefabricated school uh, with the frame of steel, in a way, proceeds further along this conceptual trajectory, attempting to deal with the problem of an artifact's rootedness in the space that surrounds and anchors its presence. And we just saw how Ramirez Vasquez aimed to transcend this problem at the museum uh, without really being able to fully create the scenography he had planned. But in the portability idea of the school format, he obviously did manage to transcend the limitations of the buildings, all the buildings I've mentioned, of course, the UNAM, the National Teacher School, even Rivera's Fresco, uh, or uh, O'Gorman's Functionalist Schools, et cetera, et cetera. And in every one of these cases, the possibility of the dynamic cinematic mural and permanent motion in conjunction with the real-time dynamic experience of space, which is a fundamental problem that really everyone involved with the muralist experience tries to deal with in one way or another, uh, was necessarily, in every case, c limited by the concreteness, the heaviness, the rootedness to a site of each of the artistic and architectural examples I've mentioned. So the schools on the left not only physically achieve more portability uh, than their predecessors for obvious reasons, but they conceptually manage to operate not as discrete objects, but as kind of media for the transmission of the radical experience of, radi of um, avant-garde Mexican public education. Thus, the school you're seeing there on the left, which is defined by a light frame of galvanized steel, by, in this case, mural-sized images of leaders, like Zapata himself, who is featured on the mural on the right, is can be understood as a powerful extrapolation from the president of the portable mural. It builds materially, it builds conceptually on the prototype uh, uh, on the right. It further abstracts the supporting frame from the object as such, but it fulfills the essential function that uh, that portable mural was really meant to uh, fulfill, which is to serve as a vessel for cultural transmission beyond the specificity of the narrative of its painted image. So, and really thanks to Ramirez Vasquez's political connections, very carefully uh, cultivated political connections over the years, what happens is that uh, the prototype by the late 60s has become this lingua franca for school construction in many parts of the world. And it remained in this position for at least a couple decades. The image on the right is, uh, speaks a little bit to the international exposure of the schools and more importantly of their rationale for construction. It's a cover of an official publication of CONESCAL, which was this transnational agency devoted to school construction, a kind of transnational version of CAPSE, uh, connected to uh, UNESCO's, uh, UNESCO's cultural wing, which is announcing in that cover that this idea of communal action that is built so powerfully into the prototype of the schools for Mexico should be the shared ethos for school building throughout Latin America and the developing world. So, what is exported here, which moves beyond all the precedents, isn't so much the object 
the, the, the resulting object from an experimental trajectory, but a method for experimental education that is simultaneously a medium and an object. And the paradox really is, to finish, that although these schools were really built en masse uh, throughout a considerable part of the planet, and perhaps because none of the specific units was as spectacular as any one of the many murals produced outside of Mexico around the same time, these buildings are simultaneously ubiquitous and uh, almost invisible, sort of like a, a vernacular of uh, school construction that some of you, I'm sure, may have even seen and not realized what it was that you were seeing. They were so much more discreet than their preceding experiments. But the rural schools and this heroic teacher, which was sent you know, uh, inside of this vessel deployed in Mexico and throughout the world aboard one of these units for decades, essentially fulfilled the ambitions of generations of cultural avant-gardists in Mexico in the process. Thank you. really interesting because this is, and again, I have to qualify when I say it's painted by the users because it's painted by the users, but in the, in the, in the framework of this clientelist relationship, because that's kind of a propaganda mural uh, in a way uh, for, if you look here, for example, this reads, uh, the accomplished, uh, this is the accomplished goal of the Mexican Revolution, and it says ALM, which is Adolfo Lopez Mateos, the president of Mexico. Uh, so it's a quote from a president embedded within this mural. And this is uh, talking about the, the books that are included in the mural. And then embedded within it is this, a series of portraits of the users of the school. Uh, and of course, uh, the Mexican coat of arms is included. So it's really interesting to think about the authorship of these artifacts because it is, it, they are painted by, mostly by uh, users, residents of the schools, um, but they are painted always um, in this, um, they become another device of the clientelist relationship. So it, they, the authorship is, in that sense, kind of uh, mixed. It happens in this interface between state and user, where the mural becomes one more platform through which to, on the one hand, extol, celebrate the state, but also demand things from the state. And some of these murals are actually critical, um, and they actually are kind of a surface where you can um, uh, demand uh, better schools, better implementation for the schools, all these kind of things. So they become this uh, very interesting social space of communication and interface between state and user. But that, in and of itself, is built into the logic of the schools, too, from the beginning. In fact, uh, because the school actually provides, it, it basically provides uh, uh, no rules for the exterior or for the cladding. It really only provides the structure. The project is that frame. Uh, and, um, but however, the mural as a format, and I think this is directly connected to the, the long history of murals being part of educational spaces, uh, kind of organically becomes this really important surface where the mission of the project is perpetuated, but it's also challenged all the time. 
So yeah, it's it's important to look closely at these things. And and you know, in terms of technical dexterity, this is actually a very impressive mural, one of the better ones that you would find. So yeah. Um, when you look at this mural, it seems sort of a bit universalist. These kids could be almost anywhere. And I was wondering if there's some tension between sort of uh, making this as a site that could be students anywhere achieving in the developing world versus sort of nationalist types of in, you know, right. impulses like certain right. particular heroes in a particular or imagery in particular New Mexico. And how does that play? That, that, that's a great question. I mean, obviously, um, the first thing one must say about this question is that when, when you talk about uh, Mexican cultural nationalism, particularly at this moment, um, what, one has to be very aware that that formation in and of itself is absolutely universalist. That's to say, everybody who's articulating nationalism in Mexico, and when I say this, I mean everybody from this architect or public intellectuals like Octavio Paz or others from this era, people, all of whom have some kind of relationship with the state apparatus. Uh, there is no contradiction in that formation for extreme uh, open, almost chauvinistic nationalism and a parallel universalist, at least a gloss for the nationalist message. Although I think there's actually a deeper relationship. So that's to say that all these people, including this architect, are aware of this relationship between a kind of universalist cosmopolitan aspiration for everything that they're doing, everything that they produce, that the state produces at this time, is meant to be universally intelligible uh, and applicable, like the schools. And, and this actually applies to all kinds of culture, really. Um, and at the same time, there's a way in which those same cultural artifacts reinforce a very precise national message. Um, and in terms of the schools, this is actually very interestingly illustrated in the program for the schools, because there are things about the schools that are, uh, have to be there, that are kind of universal to all the schools, it's like the frame and like that pantheon of uh, national kind of uh, heroes, founding fathers. Um, and then everything else about the schools is variable, it's contingent, it's local, it's specific. Um, so, in a way, the schools themselves uh, are very consistent with how national cultures produce in Mexico as, as a whole at this time. Um, I think that there is, you'd be, uh, it'd be harder to find uh, uh, anything culturally nationalist here that is culturally nationalist in a reductive way that prevents it from being universally legible. The whole project of this regime at this time is to retool Mexican cultural nationalism. Along, along the lines of a, a very obvious uh, kind of universalizing cosmopolitan message. And in this case, clearly you've read the image the way you should read it. It is, there's something about this image that roots it, certain uh, kind of aspects of the image are rooted in Mexico. That's the local component. But that message of education for development, the message of uh, prefabrication being the technological um, uh, kind of uh, alternative for the developing world is meant from the beginning of the launch of these schools as a universalizing rhetoric. Yeah. And then the, this tension runs through cultural nationalism in Mexico always, I think, from way longer than this point. But it has a very sophisticated articulation at this time, uh, where the two things seamlessly uh, intertwine, uh, as they do in the literal form of the schools, too. John? Just on the composition of this, were they working with sort of schemata for how you're supposed to compose a mural, or was it really? Because we've only seen maybe one of them from a school, but I mean, or was it really all over the, the map? Because it's not, I mean, it's, it's technically good in the sort of, in the details, yeah. but it's also, there's a plan here that seems, like, I mean, I mean, but I don't know, I'd be surprised if that were. Uh, this is better than the norm. <laughs> but, uh, but, I mean, uh, the sort of the structure, the arc, the yeah. arch there, you know, is that? Um, yeah, I know, but actually, you'd be surprised. I, mean, I think I would say that uh, it, it isn't. They are impressively proficient. The majority of the ones that that, and they're usually placed in the same part of the school, which is uh, to explain the kind of the plan. This is the, the kind of the bigger first external facade of the school. This is the way you would approach the school. This is the kind of public face of the school. The back of the school is where the teacher lives, uh, and the back of the classroom. Um, and uh, in terms of the actual project, as I said, there's really no, no, no plan for the kind of pictorial dimension or, uh, you know, of course the dimensions are always the same because the frame is always the same. So over the course of time, uh, there are these kind of recurring types of composition, this being one of them, that use the architectural frame of that particular wall and then create a composition very, in this case, symmetrically aligned with the frame that the wall provides, right? 
Uh, but I, I, there is no real rule um, uh, or constant in the mural presence in these schools. Um, which really kind of ties in with an, uh, a deeper point, I think, about the relationship between this and muralism. That's to say that the, the way in which this is more, more than through the presence of murals per se, the way these schools are powerfully connected to muralism as a question, as a conceptual question, has to do with the idea that these are uh, uh, infinitely replicable, not one-of-a-kind artifacts, right, that fulfill the deeper mission of the portable mural. That's to say that even when there are no murals in sight, the logic of the muralist exporting, right, which, uh, which uh, was the kind of the crutch and the limitation of previous muralist exercises, is what animates the, the performance and the operation of the schools. And within uh, that practical program for the buildings, you have quite the range of, of specific murals, specific incarnations of murals. Some of them, like this one, very obviously attuned to the frame of the building, others not so much. Some of them are quite abstract, for example, uh, and using all these kinds of color materials. Uh, and there's really quite, quite a variety. Um, but the function that the murals serve is fairly consistent in terms of being simultaneously a kind of propaganda, but also contestation space. In terms of the desire for it to be public, specifically? The desire right. Well, it's interesting because, uh, you know, at the, at the muralism has a number of kind of births, right? And it's not at all a kind of cohesive uh, cultural space. But one of the recurring ideas, of course, is a desire, at least, for uh, public dimension of the... And, and in, a, in addition to that, or attached to that, a kind of... Uh, I guess uh, sometimes populist, sometimes kind of democratizing impulse to find the production of these uh, artworks, right? And which isn't unique, of course, to Mexico or to muralism. It's, it's one of the most powerful kind of radical vanguard directions in which cultural production uh, moves in the early 20th century, which is one of the uh, kind of points of origin of muralism that is simultaneously specific to the Mexican situation, but is also part of a much bigger modernist project um, uh, and uh, not only attached to radical social movements, but often attached to them, that defines all these avant-gardes right, globally, in addition to the Mexican, and in conjunction with the Mexican one. There is, however, uh, and there are also kind of periods in the history of muralism, uh, and as Professor Coffey, Coffey knows very well, of course, over the course of the officialization of muralism, certain things about muralist, pro especially in the late pe later periods of muralist experiences, certain things about the experience become, uh, certain rhetorics around the experience of muralism become very much kind of codified and standardized. Uh, so that by the late muralist moment in which this appears, there is, especially uh, in state-sponsored commissions, which are the majority of muralist commissions, not the only ones, but the majority of them, uh, there is built into a mural, is, there is this kind of uh, populist discourse of inclusion, inclusivity, but along very uh, uh, specific ideological lines, right? So it's hard to uh, find uh, in the desire for um, uh, the public dimension of the artwork something that is uniquely Mexican about this. That's to say that certain uh, contours of that conversation are specific to the Mexican situation at different moments in the 20th century. But I think it also, there's also this universalizing impulse and collectivist impulse that drives muralism that it shares with other avant-gardes from other places. Uh, and of course, muralism is always a transnational phenomenon, not only in terms of where muralist, murals are, you know, one major mural being here, uh, very far from Mexico, uh, and uh, other murals scattered physically around the world, but also in terms of who these people who become the muralists are in terms of their own transnational identities when they're, when they're kind of beginning to practice in the mode. And where, of course, the format of the mural, which is itself kind of a uni cultural universal mural, appropriated and Mexicanized in this period, comes from. So 
um, I, don't, I wouldn't say that that's something particularly Mexican about the experience, but it is obvious that over the course of the history of Mexican muralist experiences, the uh, desire for uh, the public dimension of artworks does become a predominant factor. Yeah. One more question, or I, we can all go up to the reception, and, and those of you who want to speak in more informally with Professor Castaneda can do that. Any more? All right, then. We'll see you upstairs. Thank you. Thank you.